What is up guys? We're going to be talking about stored cross-site scripting and to help us do that we have this lab and the goal of the lab is to submit a comment that calls the JavaScript alert function when the blog post is viewed. So if we check out the lab we see a blog with various posts and if we click view post and scroll down we'll see that we have the ability to leave a comment on this blog post. Now the first question we might have is what's the difference between stored cross-site scripting and reflected cross-site scripting? With reflected cross-site scripting, the results of the attack are immediately executed in response to our vulnerable HTTP request. With stored cross-site scripting, we submit the vulnerable HTTP request with the cross-site scripting payload, but it's not executed immediately it's stored somewhere, perhaps in a database. That threat lies dormant until a user visits that specific location, i.e. a page where that database entry is extracted for the purposes of being displayed on that page, and the cross-site scripting payload is executed at that moment. So because there is that delay between the vulnerable HTTP request and the execution of the exploit, Stored cross-site scripting is sometimes referred to as secondary cross-site scripting or sometimes persistent cross-site scripting because the attack persists in the database until it's manually removed. So let's see an example of this. When we type special characters into our comment, they should be filtered out by the back end and when they're returned to the front end, they should ideally be encoded so that none of those special characters have special functions. So for example, if I were to type a h1 tag and type hello world into the comment box, well, we should actually just get this exact string as a comment and we should be able to see these h1 tags because they've been filtered in the correct way. Now we need to fill out the other details here in order to post our comment. So let's do that. So it's thank you for your comment. Your comment has been submitted. Let's go back to the blog and we can then see our comment. Well, guess what? We don't see H1. We actually see that that HTML has been passed as valid HTML. And that's exactly why we have large purple font rather than the regular font. Now, if it's not handling H1 tags correctly, there's the possibility that we can inject some JavaScript here. So we type script alert, which is our JavaScript function, which is going to deliver a pop-up to the page. Now this is where the stored XSS side of this comes in. So let's fill out the rest of our information. Now this is the vulnerable HTTP request that we're about to submit. But what happens initially is that we don't see the immediate results of this specific attack. This blog comment in inverted commas is persisted into a database somewhere so that any time a user visits this particular blog, this comment is then going to be loaded up. But of course, it's not just going to load up the text, it's actually going to execute the JavaScript here. So let's post the HTTP request. We don't see any indication aside from the giant orange header there, congratulations, you've solved the lab. We don't see any indication that that HTTP request was vulnerable. However, when we go back to the blog, now is when we get the JavaScript alert. Now the advantage of stored cross-site scripting is that essentially anyone who now visits this blog is going to be victim to this specific cross-site scripting attack. With a reflected cross-site scripting attack, we essentially need to convince the user why they need to follow some type of specific URL. And if they follow that URL, then the attack will be successful. But if we think about what a cross-site scripting attack might look to do, it might look to steal session information, for example, so we can hijack the user's session. However, in order to steal session information, our user has to be logged in and have an active session at the time they follow the reflected cross-site scripting attack link. So really there's going to be a measure of luck involved Maybe the victim does follow that particular cross-site scripting link, but they're just not logged in at the time, so the attack's going to fail. Even though the JavaScript gets executed, 
It's not executed within the context of an active session where the user has been authenticated and has session credentials. So the attack fails, even though the JavaScript executes. Here, with a stored cross-site scripting attack, not only does it potentially attack many more users, for example, anyone who's a member of this site and visits this blog post, but also there's a much higher chance, depending on where this cross-site scripting attack is placed, that those users are going to have an active session at that moment in time when they visit this particular page. So in terms of severity, a stored cross-site scripting attack can do generally more widespread damage than a reflected cross-site scripting attack, which is always going to rely on that preliminary mode of delivery where we have to get a vulnerable link into the hands of the target. And just to reiterate why this is also called persistent cross-site scripting, well, what happens if I refresh the page? The alert jumps up again. And if I refresh the page, the alert jumps up again. So it's persistent. It's in that database until the admin of the site decide that they want to remove it. With reflected cross-site scripting, once the victim has followed the link, the attack is essentially over whether it was successful or not. All right, hopefully you got a basic overview of what stored cross-site scripting is, along with the differences between stored cross-site scripting and reflected cross-site scripting. Thanks very much for watching.